This is Join Us in France, episode 229. Bonjour, I'm Annie Sargent, and I'm glad to be with you today. On today's episode, professional photographer Valérie Jardin chats with me about street photography in Paris. And if you're thinking this episode isn't for me because you're not all that interested in photography, let me tell you this. Au contraire! Street photography means capturing the essence of the moment. And which one of you doesn't want to capture the essence of your vacation in Paris or wherever in France? You can do this with any camera. A smartphone will do. But you do need a little knowledge from a photography educator. Valérie Jardin is also French. She lives in America and also has a podcast. So we have a lot in common. I'm really excited to have her on the show. Show notes and photos for this episode are on joinusinfrance.com forward slash 229. I can tell from the download stats that there are a lot of new people finding the podcast and listening, which makes me very, very happy. Bienvenue to all of you. And since there won't be a new episode next Sunday, that's April 15th, 2019, may I recommend that you subscribe to the podcast? When you are subscribed, you can see all the back episodes and pick more to listen to. And some podcast apps even have a search feature. If you're going to Provence, you can search for episodes having to do with Provence and the same for anywhere else in France. Join Us in France is brought to you by Patreon supporters and Addicted to France, the small group tour company for people who want to enjoy France with a small group and with yours truly. Check our upcoming half-day in-person walking tours in Paris, May 7th and May 8th, uh, 2019 on addictedtofrance.com. How about we go to Montmartre together or maybe Père Lachaise? How about Saint-Germain-des-Prés or the Latin Quarter? That's on May 7th and 8th, 2019, and you can see it on addictedtofrance.com. And I will also soon be releasing my first GPS-aware audio tour because I get a lot of emails from lovely people who want to tour with me, but they're not going to be in Paris on the right dates. And so I decided, look, I have to provide something. And so for those people, there will soon be GPS aware audio tours where I tell you the same things I would tell you if I were there in person. The GPS guides you, it takes you to all the cool spots, tells you all the cool stories, and you can do that any day of the year. Now, that's going to be coming out soon. I will announce it's uh, it's very close, but I want to make sure it's perfect. And now on with my conversation with Valérie Jardin after a tiny bit of music. I love that music. Bonjour. Bonjour, Valérie. What a pleasure it is to talk to you. Nice to talk to you, too, finally. We, uh, we've been planning this for a little while. That's right. You're a busy woman. <laughs> yes. I'm too busy at times. That's all right. That's all right. Well, uh, Valérie, uh, j just in, in way of introduction, let me say that you are also a French person, as people can probably hear already. And you... Yes. You live in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and you are I a professional do. photographer. Yes, actually, I, I wasn't a photographer before moving to the U.S. And uh, I just started my uh, my own business about 20, 21 years ago. <laughs> and and I worked for clients for, for many years. And uh, eight years ago, I quit working for commercial clients and started just traveling the world for my photography and educating others. So wonderful. Been, uh, been wonderful. Cool. Yeah. And you also do a podcast. Yes, I have a weekly podcast. <laughs> I've been podcasting for nearly five years. Right. So we're about the same. Uh, I might, I, I, I think I started mine a little over five years ago. So we're about uh, the same in, in that regard. Anyway. Commitment. 
Commitment, yes, big commitment. Anyway, I, I, uh, that's how I heard about you, and uh, because I enjoy photography. And today, I would really like to talk to you about doing street photography in Paris, because mm -hmm. um, you know I take photos in the street, but you do street photography. It's not the same thing at all, is it? Well, yeah, street photography or documentary photography is more than just photographing random people on the streets. It's right. really about telling a story in a frame. And, uh, and there is a, it, it's, it is the most difficult genre of photography anyone will ever do because mm. you, you have control of your vision and your camera, but you don't have control of what, what people are going to do. So <laughs> you have to, to see, to be able to see and react quickly. Right. So do, do you actually ever set things up or no? Oh, never, never. never. Okay. That would completely defeat the purpose to me. It's always completely candid. And uh, and that's the difficult part. It's about capturing a moment in time that has never happened and will never happen again. And uh, that only lasts a fraction of a second. So you walk around with the purpose of capturing a moment and you have your mm -hmm. camera in hand. Yes. Do you have it Red mostly ready. on auto settings because you don't have time to fiddle <laughs> with your settings. <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, you, you let the camera do a lot of the work. It's really yeah. not about the, the gear. It's really about seeing. Anyone can learn to use a camera. That's right. the easy part of photography. Not everyone is able to see. And uh, indeed, you don't go and shoot street photography in full manual. I mean, you need to take control of your of your camera so you're not in full auto either otherwise you won't control whether you want to freeze motion or you want to have a motion blur or right. your camera has absolutely no vision so your camera won't know where you want to focus if it's on right. the first person or the second person so you need to be able to control that <laughs> but um but like i either you you'll go into zone focusing or, or zone focusing or you auto focus you rarely go into manual focusing because mm -hmm. that takes yeah. more time and really you don't have that much time. Right, right. Uh, and so right. you, I, I, I usually shoot on uh, aperture priority. So okay. I control everything else through the aperture. And uh, well, and, and I since you know what time of day cameras. it is, you, the ISO, you know what you're going to do anyway. Yeah. You know, if and the it, ISO, the camera is very smart. The, you know, the ISO can, can uh, set itself. And uh, I never worry about ISO. I, mm. I, mm -hmm. I never denoise. I never worry about high ISO at all. Okay. Mm. All right. Well, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. Because I, I think I understand what you're saying about, you know, waiting for the right moment, because I do some uh, basketball photography. And at first I was mostly doing, you know, spray and pray kind of thing. You know, you take a thousand, you, you go as fast as your camera will go. And then you go home with 5,000 photos that you don't know what to do with. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then as time went by, a few years into it, I, I learned how to wait for the moment. You yeah. know, you learn to, w what you want, really. You want to capture an, a certain type of action. And so I, I assume you can get to that same point with street photography. Yeah. I mean, some people do machine gun it or, or yeah. s spray and pray. <laughs> uh, and, and that's definitely something you you want to do when you shoot sports, unless you really know the sport. And as you said, as you're shooting basketball, you you get to know the game and you can anticipate yeah. what's going to happen. So it's all about anticipation yeah. and being able to anticipate the decisive moment on the street. So you you become better at it as you do it and uh, and as you learn people behavior it's just right. like doing wildlife photography you gonna at first you don't know what the animal is going to do what is when is the bird going to <laughs> to do the same you know uh, circle and or whatever right so you learn the habit of the bird and you do <laughs> it's the same thing with people really people tend to you know to repeat a gesture for example so you can anticipate that moment 
it. And uh, and I shoot very close. I shoot with a 23 millimeter lens, so I'm I'm uh, I'm shooting wide angle. I'm really close to people. So uh, if I machine gun it that close, even though my camera is silent, they're gonna notice me. And the point is that people don't change whatever they're doing. So you capture that candid, that beautiful moment of life that okay. is candid. Right. And so you cannot you cannot uh, uh, approach it like sports because people people will stop doing whatever caught your eye in the first place and there is no shot at that point so right, what's the right, point right right mm-hmm. so, so uh, i assume you sit at a cafe or something and you just watch what's happening and and think about what you want to capture uh, i let the street surprise me so i can i can walk all day i mean i i'll walk you know, 15, 20 kilometers, no problem with my camera in a day in Paris uh, when I'm by myself. Um, Sometimes you just see light and you just wait. You mm. find a really great backdrop and then uh, then you wait for the right subject. Again, mm. it's all about being discerning and not just anyone that's going to walk through that light is going to be worthy of that light. You know, you have to find really the authentic, mm-hmm. beautiful subject, very discerning. Um, I'm not going to photograph a tourist walking by. Mm-hmm. You know, It just doesn't interest me. If I'm in yeah. Paris, I'm going to photograph more the authenticity of Paris. If mm-hmm. I'm in Rome, same thing. So you, so it takes patience. It takes a lot of patience. And I'm not a patient person for anything else, but I am for <laughs> photography because I'm not, I'd rather not press the shutter than, than press the shutter just because I settle. I'll never, ever settle for a mediocre shot. Mm-hmm. I'd rather just leave this beautiful light un, untouched and just move on. Uh-huh. Because um, if I if I find a really great spot, otherwise you just I just walk around and there is a story at every street corner. You just have to see it. People don't people look but they don't see. And and life is so beautiful. Ordinary life when you freeze it in a frame mm-hmm. and you have that moment in time forever mm-hmm. it's really beautiful and yeah. i think it is so valuable and so important i mean you look back at the work of uh, of cartier bresson or douaneau and and we learn so much from those th- that era you know mm-hmm. people on the street doing everyday things so mm-hmm. I, I think the the that i i take my I take my duty as a street photographer very seriously because I feel that it has a historical value. I was I was at the historical uh, at a historical uh, library in Paris recently, and I looked at a lot of old photos. And there were people who documented, like the right after the the well the Haussmann uh, mm-hmm. uh, modifications of Paris, I guess. Um, yes. And there's a bazillion photos, and they're so interesting because they it is. They captured a lot of workers and a lot of things that uh, you don't think about. You know, you think, wow, this building is beautiful. <laughs> and then you go back in the photography and, um, yeah, it's it's beautiful. And they were... Oh, it is, it is interesting. And, and just, I mean, look at pictures even from 20 years ago. And you look at the fashion and the cars are different and everything. Mm-hmm. It's fun. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's really what we do. We are documenting a time in history. Really. Right. So I uh, let's get this question out of the way. I think I know what you're going to say, but um, are you nervous that people are going to get mad at you? If they no, see you? it's never it's never happened, and it's okay if people see me. I'm not trying to hide. I'm mm. trying to stay invisible so that I don't I don't affect what I see. Uh, because as you know, if people notice that you photograph them, they're they're going to change whatever they're doing. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. it's not like I'm being sneaky or I'm hiding. I'm just I learned to be invisible and very discreet with my camera so that I can capture that 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 moment mm-hmm. in a candid way. But if people see me and that happens that people see me more, more often than not, they're just, you know, I move on and and they don't even ask anything if they come to me and ask, oh, did you just photograph me? I said, yes. What a beautiful moment. Look at the light was the way the light sh- was shining on your hair. It was just amazing. And mm. uh, love the way you dressed or and, and that seriously, anywhere in the world, people are so responsive to that. They're flattered. They're they usually don't know what you're doing. It's and, and I'm not hiding. I'm not hiding behind a long lens. You don't shoot photography behind a long lens. You shoot it right there within uh-huh. within a, a well, meters. Well, 20, me- yeah, 20 millimeters, yeah. you're close. 
I'm close. I'm shooting at wide angle. Yeah. And that's what street documentary photography is. You're huh. close. You're in the scene with people. So um, people are more intrigued than anything else. And they totally understand when you tell them, well, I'm, you know, I'm doing a story on Paris today, or I'm documenting life mm. on the streets of New York or wherever it is. I, I've shot from Australia to, you know, anywhere in, in uh, North America, so many countries in Europe. People are people. They're very, they, they're flattered, first of all, that you find them interesting enough to photograph them. Mm. And, uh, and if somebody is uncomfortable with it, well, then you just explain what you're doing. It's not worth a fight. You know, if, if somebody is uncomfortable, then I'll never share the picture. I'll never post the picture. Mm -hmm. But um, it's never happened, honestly. And okay. I've been doing yeah. this uh, for many years. I, I teach this all over the world. Um, it's all about your, first of all, if you're very nervous, you're going to, you're going to send the wrong vibes. And so <laughs> you just have to be confident that you're doing something important and be very respectful. I am extremely respectful. I would never post a picture of someone that if it was me, I would feel uncomfortable with that picture uh -huh. being out there. I'm respectful. I'm photographing the beauty of everyday life. I'm mm -hmm. not looking for uh, moments of crisis. I'm not photographing um, uh, people in embarrassing or vulnerable situations. Right. It's just the beauty of everyday life, which I find if we do it right, is is very valuable. Otherwise, all we'll have left are surveillance footage. Mm -hmm. And what is that going to do? Are we going to make books out of that? Like we no. have books of, you know, street photography from the 30s, 40s, 50s, which are amazing to look at. So it, it's important. And it's that's why it's important that that street to educate street photographers to to be respectful because there are a lot of disrespectful street photographers out there don't get me wrong there mm -hmm, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. a popular genre everybody thinks that they can do it but uh there are a lot of uh people that are that are doing damage to right. this type of photography well, and, and actually french yeah. law prohibits uh, prohibits people from taking photos of other people in vulnerable or embarrassing situations that, absolutely that's, that's the standard that's lot. yeah that's <laughs> right that's the standard like uh, i have a i have a niece who's a lawyer and so i asked her the question you know can i photograph anything in the streets she says your purpose must not must never be to uh to embarrass or um or put somebody in a vulnerable situation. If you're not Absolutely. doing that, and kids, you have to be a little careful too. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, um, but if you're not doing that, you're fine. You're in public, you're fine. So that's, yeah, that's the absolutely. rule. Absolutely. And that, that's good to hear it from, uh, from a, a lawyer in France because I, people ask that question all the time. And I said, yeah, the privacy laws are popping up. And they're not really laws, but they're... They're very gray and they're popping up all over the place. But mm -hmm. thankfully, you know, and even in a court of law, uh, the the subject who wants to uh, who, for example, somebody takes you to court, they would have to prove that you did damage to them. Right. And uh, and thankfully, the you know, uh, we still the the judges still recognize the merit of art. Right. And uh, and the importance of, of photographing everyday life, mm -hmm. and we're under, we're under surveillance twenty four seven. You sure <laughs> are. Yeah, when you're in you Paris, so, you are. Yeah, yeah. So, where do you have favorite spots to go doing uh, street photography in Paris? Well, like neighborhoods, you know, I, only small something. I I usually stay in the fifth. Uh, that's kind of my home away from home. Mm -hmm. I, I'm always in the fifth because it's my neighborhood, but. Um, we really, you know, there there are stories everywhere, and I sometimes I'll just uh, take the metro just for the fun of photographing life in the metro, you know, and uh, <laughs> without any other purpose. Otherwise, I just walk, walk, walk. I, I call it getting lost on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, I I love to be surprised. It depends on the the day, you know. I'll follow the light. If uh, if I have a bright right. sunny day, um, I'll look for shafts of light. And if it's a Rainy, overcast day, yeah, then yeah. then I'll probably have to get a little closer and and focus more on on emotions and expressions of people. I photograph inside cafes and museums, and uh, it there is no bad place as long as there are people. 
there there are stories and uh I I like more authentic. I tend to stay away from the big touristy spots because I'm not interested in photographing tourists. Mm -hmm. But that said, I teach visual storytelling and uh, travel photography. So I, sometimes I give that assignment to my students where, okay, if I, if I bring you to the Eiffel Tower, can you actually produce a shot that hasn't been done before? <laughs> and um, <laughs> of any, I mean, the most photograph monument in the world and uh and that's a great challenge for a photographer so um so it's really about seeing outside the postcard shots and and seeing in a way that others don't see and and um so we work on exercises like that so sometime actually being in a spot where it's so touristy that you feel like oh everything has been done <laughs> well that gets you um gets you thinking and yeah. and then that's when incorporating the human element in your shot will give you your own iconic photograph of a landmark because that photograph has never been done before and never will mm -hmm. so you know it's really um it's there's i i just love i just love seeing it in a new way and i'm always excited when uh, when when one of my students shows me a shot that i totally um, that I wish I had shot myself <laughs> or that I did not expect that I had never seen before. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's, that's pretty amazing as a, as a educator, it's, it's really the top. So is that yeah. why a lot of street photography is black and white just to give it a, a little bit different, uh, it gives a different feeling when you look at a black and white photo. Yeah, um, well, I let the subject really dictate that choice mm -hmm. because sometimes the, the story is all about color. Uh, other times the color is a distraction from what you want to tell, mm -hmm. uh, what you want to say. So if I want the, the viewer to look at my subject, but there is a very bright, colorful distraction right next to them well obviously your eye will go to the color so then then black and white will definitely make a stronger mm -hmm. uh, stronger photograph but uh, other than other than that sometime it's all about color and 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 making a black and white photograph of a story that's all about color would make absolutely no right, sense right. so i should i should both uh i make that decision in camera and oh, okay. uh, but I sh I should I should both. A lot of street photographers will only do one or the other, and that's that's fine. It's mm -hmm. just that uh, then there are very uh, colorful scenes that they won't photograph because if they see in black and white only, then they won't even notice that. Right. I I, I thought of that because when you were saying you know a shot of the Eiffel Tower that's never been done, the only thing I could think of is like I'd go right up close and do a black and white picture of the rivets or something i don't know mm -hmm. i try yeah. that just to see what it, if it looks good or not i don't know um because it that's a that would be a hard one like never been oh, done it is. <laughs> <laughs> the pressure is on <laughs> so do you do cityscapes as well i i do i mean i i'm a i don't even call myself a street photographer i'm a visual storyteller and mm. uh, so i shoot pretty much anything that moves me but uh, i'm known for my street photography and that's what people come to me to to study uh but that said i photograph s still life um every, every day you know mm -hmm. the light can make anything mundane look amazing actually That's i true. just posted uh, a picture of sub, you know just an old building wall and windows but the light was creating shadows that make that wall look look like the most extraordinary thing so mm -hmm. it's really about seeing yeah. and um And so um, it's it's but really the soul of a place is about the people. And if you do travel photography without including people in your shots, you're missing the whole the soul of the place. So mm -hmm. it's really a, about, yeah, incorporating the human element one way or another. And there's so many ways to do it. You can totally do street photography without revealing the identity of your subject at all. Mm -hmm. And I've actually written a book about that called Anonymous. And you can work with silhouettes and shadows. There's mm -hmm. so many mm -hmm. ways to so do it. So what, what advice would you give to just regular people, not photographers, who are visiting mm -hmm. Paris and want to, you know, up their game in photography a little bit, do, do a little better? Well, do you have like simple things they could try? Oh, absolutely. Uh, again, try to 
to see differently, try to, um, and, and a good exercise is to, to photograph an iconic landmark in a different way. I mean, look for reflections in puddles, look for reflections in a scooter's rearview mirror of, uh, of an iconic landmark. Mm. Look for things like that. Incorporate people in your shot. You know, they could be a bicyclist uh, zooming by and, and then your iconic landmark in the back. Mm -hmm. uh, that will make a more give more interest than having just a, a, the place completely deserted from people. Oh, sure, which, yeah, yeah. You know, first of all, what time of the day will you have to be there? And uh, and to me, it really has no interest if it's completely devoid of people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very interesting. So for cityscapes in Paris, like, do you like... I, people are always asking me, where's a, where's a good place in Paris to go take a picture from up high? And so I give them oh. the usual, you know, Tour Montparnasse, of course, the yeah. Eiffel Tower. But then if you're on the Eiffel Tower, you don't see it. You uh, don't see it. Tour right. Montparnasse is definitely the best place. Right. Uh, but then you have to have a long lens. Otherwise, everything yeah. is going to look tiny. That's true. But uh, go to the top of uh, Bobo. Um, right. And there from the, the bar, you have the view of the, the blue roofs of Paris. Right. And it's amazing. And for that, you really don't, you know, you can do that with your phone. Yeah. You don't need any fancy gear. Um, there, You don't have to go very high <laughs> to get very great shots. Or even Notre Dame will, will give you some great shots. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you include uh, some of the uh, chimeras or gargoyles in your shots. Um, in but the for that, you have to hoof it all the way up. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, no pain, no gain, right? <laughs> the top of the top of the uh, Arc de Triomphe is also pretty good. I've seen nice pictures that yeah. people have taken, and all, wh what I really love to do there is the le, le rond-point de l'étoile. So I I just do a, a a time lapse. I mean, that is just amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like what is really, happening? Once you have a camera you you'll never be bored you there are opportunities everywhere mm -hmm. and uh yeah i i mean i start photographing when i'm still at the airport because while i'm waiting for luggage i look up at charles de gaulle and the people that are on the upper floor that are taking their smoking breaks make amazing silhouettes because they're ah. outside and so the, i i already start doing street photography the minute i land huh. really every place is uh if once you start incorporating people in your photography there's no bad place mm -hmm. i spend my you know i travel a lot and uh when I'm at airports, I have my camera in my hand. Mm. So what's your camera and what lenses do you take? Um, well, my camera has a fixed lens, so oh. I can't change it. <laughs> it makes uh, a lot of the thinking, take a lot of the thinking out of the equation because yeah. it's one camera, one lens. It's I shoot, I'm a Fujifilm ambassador for Fujifilm USA. So I'm an ex-photographer, we call the ambassadors for the for the brand. Mm. And uh, I shoot with the uh, Fuji X100F, which is a 23 mm. millimeter uh, attached lens. It's a rangefinder type camera. It's very small. It's it's quiet. It, mm. uh, it looks like an old fashioned camera. A lot of people think it's a film camera. Uh, it's very <laughs> retro looking. And um, yeah, so it's if uh, people are used to full frame, it would be a 35 millimeter equivalent. So that's what I shoot with. I have a backup camera that actually has interchangeable lenses, but I usually have a 23 millimeter on it anyway. So, so my, you, don't, uh, you don't carry a lot of gear, actually. No, just extra batteries. That's all I need. The camera huh. is always uh, on my shoulder and uh, I have uh, extra batteries in my bag and... An and, umbrella and a snap and that's it. <laughs> and with the crop sensor, what kind of size pictures do it's, you get? Well, it's APS-C sensor. So, okay. uh, no, they're they're big files. I mean, I think that one, I don't know, I can't even remember, but it's 20 some megapixels. So it's uh, it's right. bigger than you'll ever need. Right, you know, right, right, I, right. I've, I've printed huge posters out of those files mm. and they're beautiful. Hmm. So tell me, uh, uh, so... I know you, I, we don't know each other, but I read your, your um, kind of intro on your blog and it says that you were born in Normandy. Yes. So have you explored much of the rest of France or mostly oh. Paris and Normandy? No, um, I, I, you know, I used to spend my summers as a child in the Alps, um, <laughs> in the Chamonix area. Love yeah, that area. Very Since nice. I grew up 
on the on the coast you know the it was uh our, our summers were spent in the mountains as well as the uh, winter break going skiing but um right now i really split my life between um home base in the u.s and then uh normandy still and uh, i actually teach a week-long workshop in normandy about visual storytelling and i love bringing people to my home and and uh, and it's a week uh where you know people will explore I, it's designed for photographers so mm -hmm. we'll, you know i bring people to the d-day areas with a, a bilingual historian and uh i bring them to uh some of my favorite little towns like Honfleur. there's so much to see yeah and uh and then Paris, I, I may actually do workshops in the south of France coming up. I'm, I'm exploring that. Uh, that, But right now I teach, you know, I'm, I'm heading to Barcelona soon. I hmm. teach in Berlin. I teach in New York in just a couple of days. Hmm. Um, and I do several workshops in Paris every year. So I'm uh, I'm uh, San Francisco. So, so I'm cool. pretty so much. So obviously yeah. we'll put links to your workshops uh, in the show notes of the episode so people can find them easily. Um, but like... Is there a part of France you would like to explore more, spend more time in? Yes, actually, I, um, I'd i like to, well, because I'm a city city photographer, really, I, I need, uh, not that the city has to be very big to do street photography, you know, but uh, if I teach or workshop, I need to bring people to a place that will attract them and that offers enough variety for um, if it's a week long workshop, so it has to be a fairly big city. So we yeah. explore different areas and work on different techniques. So, uh, if it's a weekend, then the city doesn't have to be as big, but, um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to go back to the South of France and Provence and, and, and maybe, uh, Nice. Mm -hmm. Um, actually I'm, I'm, I'm talking with uh, a former student of mine who, you know, we may actually, um, who may, uh, help me set up something in the South of France in the next year or Too, but but I also want to explore other places. Uh, uh, all I need is a local guide. I can teach what I teach everywhere. Anyway, right, right. Uh, yeah. So like I, I I taught in Rome for a few years. The first year I had a, a somebody local help me, you know, guide my group because I can teach anywhere. But I I need to focus on my students. So I I need somebody right. who is going to take care of the logistics. Right. And then once I know the place, then I go again and I can do it solo. Um, same with Barcelona. You know, it, yeah. it's really, um, I go to places that I want to see. Um, and hmm. then people will come. There are people who have come on every workshop. So they kind of push me to to try new places because, wow. said, hey, we've been on every workshop. Where do we go next? So, so I said, oh, where do you want to go to Amsterdam this year? Or do you want to go to Barcelona? And then they pick. I said, okay, well, let's just do Barcelona. Let's and do that. <laughs> it's fun because then I'm with, you know, 10 friends on a wow. workshop. So yeah. what are a couple of places in Normandy that people might not have heard of that you recommend they visit? Oh, well, um, I think um, definitely then, you know, people should definitely go see Honfleur when they go to Normandy yeah. as well as at Deauville. But um, what honestly, was the second I think one? Sorry, I didn't understand. Deauville. Uh, Deauville, yes. You yes. know, the, the boardwalk. Right, 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 right. Uh, Cabourg, I think, is much more beautiful than Deauville. It's much more authentic. Uh, it has much more charm and character. So oh. Cabourg, you know, it's the romantic, um, it's where the Romantic Film Festival is. And it's, um, it's, uh, the, Le Méridien de l'Amour is in, uh, is in Cabourg. So there is no place more romantic Ooh, than, wow. than <laughs> for sure. It's Marcel Proust and, uh, Oh, yeah, and oh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that is a beautiful spot. And then Bayeux is a wonderful little town. Yeah. Uh, good home base, actually, for people who want to tour Normandy is to uh, to stay in Bayeux as yeah. home base and then rent a car. And, you know, they're, then they have close proximity from everything else. It's very central. Right. And then uh, they can go to Mont Saint-Michel and then they can do the D-Day area. Yeah. They can uh, visit the coastal towns, you know, Honfleur, Deauville, Cabourg. Mm -hmm. So it's really a, a great location to stay. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And it's lovely. They can see the famous tapestry and yeah. lots of great museums there. The only too. problem with Normandy is that it rains an awful lot. <laughs> Which is great for photography, actually. Well, you know, I've been to the Mont Saint-Michel several times and I always get this freaking milky sky 
and yeah. and the and the Mont Saint Michel just doesn't pop. And I'm like, ah, get me something <laughs> different, black. I don't care. It's anything. Yeah, it's miserable on Mont Saint Michel on a on a crummy weather day. But oh, uh, it's so hard because <laughs> the Abbey is gray and everything is gray. It's, it all looks flat. <laughs> but otherwise, you know, in the rain, you have reflections, you have yeah. natural filters of the rain on the windows that you can use to create magic in photography. Mm -hmm. There's, it, it, you know, it's funny because whenever um, there is a rainy morning or something on a workshop and uh, I can see my students to start the day and they're a little sad, you know, and <laughs> no, but wait, you know, we will have opportunities that you would never have any other day. That's so true. then they get really into it. Yeah. And then the next day when it's sunny again, everybody's looking for puddles because they have so <laughs> much fun in the rain and finding new shots. That, oh, there shouldn't um, be trouble finding puddles in Normandy. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> as long as you uh, stay dry and your, your yeah. camera is dry, yeah. you know, it's fun. At least it's not extreme cold or you anything. You know, when so. I was a kid, I always wore the, the yellow rain jackets that they sell in Normandy. And they went out the of blue stock. Boots. Yes, with the blue uh, stripes inside. And then uh, they went out of style and now they're back. And But I never stopped wearing them. <laughs> but yes. I'm I'm not a, anybody who cares about fashion at all. And so now when I go out, I'm like, oh, there's they're in a, style. Yeah, they're in style. What's happening? It's weird. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, and the striped shirt, like every French person has a sailor striped shirt, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, so you're uh, definitely uh, uh, yeah. ready for the coast. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, before we end, let me ask you two things that are very silly. What's your favorite French singer or, or music or something like that? Because a lot oh. of a lot of people want to know what we French people like to listen to. I love Renaud, and I'm so oh. glad that he came back with that album uh, a couple years ago, and that made me want to listen to the old tunes again, and yeah. brought back a lot of memories. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, that's not yeah. what I had. I would have expected. See, that's that's really good. <laughs> Excellent. And what French thing will you never do again? French thing that I would never do again. Right. Like for me, I will never drink French coffee again. I, I lived in the U.S. for a long time. I got uh -huh. used to American-style coffee, and I can't drink the French stuff anymore. I'm like, no. Mm -mm -mm. Really? Like, wow. Yeah, I like it's it. too strong? Or? It's, way, it's way too strong. And definitely yeah. with no sugar. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is strong. No, what should I say? Um, that is French that I... I don't, don't know. I should say I, I don't ever want to complain again because the French <laughs> complainers, but unfortunately, I'm, I, that is something that I really kept from my uh, my upbringing. Yes, <laughs> French, so that's stuck, the French huh? Was good at complaining. <laughs> <laughs> so if I had to get rid of one thing, it would be that, to stop complaining about every little thing because, you know what, life is pretty good. <laughs> yeah, life is pretty good. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Valérie. It has been a pleasure talking to you. I learned a lot. I think I'm going to try and put some of your ideas into practice. Like I'm going <laughs> to, I like, I like what you said about just look for a spot where the light is good and wait for something to happen. Oh, yeah. And, I, and from there, you know, you, people won't notice you. Uh, I mean, if, if you, if after two hours, you're still there, they may actually start worrying about you. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the light is fleeting. So you usually only have a few minutes, right, you know, right. but, Uh, yeah, look for this really nice, beautiful light. And, and really, there is no bad light. There is no excuse. There is easy light. There is morning and evening light. That's really the easy time to be out as a photographer. Mm -hmm. But you know what? The most dramatic light will give you the best shots. And and the, the harsh shadows are amazing on the street. So mm -hmm. it's really, there is no excuse not to be out any time of the day, any time of the year. Well, yeah, I was really. going to say that because you, you said you do like week-long workshops, mm -hmm. like in the middle of the day. Of... Oh, yeah. Well, uh -huh. yeah, because it's... Uh, it's just know, different. You look for a subject that will work with that light. You know, it's your responsibility as a photographer to work with ever, whatever light you're given. So if you only shoot morning and evening... Well, you're taking the easy road yeah. um, and for any type of photography, really. Whereas in the middle of the day, it, it's going to make you work a little harder. Mm -hmm. 
And it's going to make you a better photographer, uh, you know, at the end of the day, because you're going to look for 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 subjects that really call for those harsh shadows of the midday light. And uh, and it's amazing. There, there is really no bad time to be out there. So, so one more silly question. What do you think about uh, f uh, doing photography around the theme? So oh, that's also that's also great. I have I have several <laughs> several series. Um, I have a series on hands. I have a series on a series on uh, dogs on the streets. Um, ordinary ordinary objects are beautiful. I have so many series on my website that people can look huh. that I collect images. I even have a, a an Instagram account that's just for cafe chairs. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're never, I'm never bored because when I'm out the street, um, there is always something that's going to catch my attention. Anyways, huh. Huh. Um, I have, uh, I work on getting really close to people's hands. So I get those shots When I'm at market, usually when you can get really close to people, they won't even notice you. I get hands holding a, a wicker basket or hands exchanging money or hands holding a fish yeah, or I need, whatever it I is. I need to get a silent camera because mine, even on silent, it's not silent. It's uh, not silent. Yeah, that, that shutter. helps. But yeah. I, I used to shoot with a DSLR and, uh, you know, it, it was loud, but it worked. So, yeah. you know, I think whatever camera you have, It's, it's, it's all you need. And people can practice with their phones. It's the ultimate limitation. And then you focus on seeing, not settings. And that's really the, the, the goal. Good advice. Okay. Valérie Jardin, <laughs> merci beaucoup. C'était un plaisir. Merci. And uh, anyone can uh, find me, Google Valérie Jardin. Uh, and uh, you'll find pretty much everything I do. Yep, and there will be links on the show notes. And uh, I, you know, if you want to tell me when your upcoming uh, workshops are in France, uh, I'm sure. I mean, most of the people who listen to this show are visitors, and so mm -hmm. uh, they only come to France for a week or two or something. So they might not be here when when you're doing the workshop, but. Um, no, people come from Australia for the the Paris workshop. They come from all over. So, uh -huh. um, yeah, this year I already, you know, started Paris in January. So now the next round, I think I have a couple spots left for July and all then right. uh, October, I think, in Paris. And, uh, yeah, Normandy, they fill up really quickly. Some of them are full. Are full a, a year in advance but wow. um yeah valeriejardin.com and they'll find all the information excellent merci beaucoup valerie merci à bientôt au revoir au revoir thank you sally porta maria trenzado melissa martin teresa bunting karen roca karen solcher Janice Medina and Oliver Washington for pledging to support the show on Patreon this week. And my thanks to all the other patrons who support the show month after month. Thank you for giving back. Would you buy me a coffee if we met in real life? Well, you can do that by supporting the show on Patreon for as little as $2 a month. Visit patreon.com forward slash join us, P-A-T-R-E-O. N. Join us, no spaces or dashes, to see the different reward tiers. And thank you so much for giving back. I couldn't do this without you. Thank you also, William Clem and Rosaline Austin, for tipping your guide. You can do that by going to any episode page and looking for a green button that says tip your guide. And yes, I do appreciate a tip for a job well done. There's been a lot of new people finding the Facebook group as well as the podcast, but half of them on Facebook don't realize that there is a podcast as well as a Facebook group. They tell me that they found the group through Facebook advertising, which, but well, I don't advertise the show, so um, <laughs> it couldn't be that. But, but please help them out by letting them know about the podcast. I've also had to change some settings in Facebook because I was getting slammed with undesirable posts and comments from you know, the Illuminati and some criminal who claims you can cure HIV with herbal remedies. And these people are relentless. They, they, you know, they will create 50 posts or comments within a minute. I delete them. I block them. 
and they create a new account and they do it all over again. Anyway, I've had to close Facebook messaging uh, on the page and turn on post approval for the Facebook page. So I'm going to be a little bit harder to reach on Facebook. But if you want to reach me, uh, send me an email, annie at joinusinfrance.com. Or if you're a patron, of course, message me with, via Patreon. I, re I respond to patrons as soon as I see them, which I can't do with emails because I get so many of them. And speaking of that, uh, if you are interested in doing a trip report with me, I've had several people volunteer. Thank you so much. Uh, but don't drop the ball. If you've written to me and told me I want to do a trip report and then you don't hear back, it's not that I don't want you. It's just that I get too many emails and I'm not very organized when it comes to emails. As you know, you can find Join Us in France on Apple Podcasts, Pandora, Spotify, Alexa, Google Home, YouTube, and joinusinfrance.com as well. Please tell someone. I'm off to Nice uh, on the Riviera in a few days with my friends Brenda, and I'm really excited because it's been several years since I've visited Nice, and even when I did, it was to work, so I spent most of my days in an office, but not this time. I want to see every nook and cranny of the old city of Nice and nearby attractions too. Have a great week of trip planning. Lots of you are in France this time of year. I hope you have a lovely time. I will not talk to you next week, uh, but patrons will hear from me via Patreon and you can follow my Nice trip on social media too. Au revoir. The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2019 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. <laughs>